Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have everybody's attention, please. Uh, again, like I said, it's absolutely amazing to see everybody out here tonight. Uh, we will be bringing in more chairs, uh, so if you hear some rustling back in the back, we'll have some more chairs being put out here momentarily. Um, but with that, a little bit breathlessly, I'd like to go ahead and get us started tonight. Uh, so, of course, tonight is July 19th, 2017, and on behalf of the Director of the United States Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Jeffrey Mangelsdorf, it is, and the entire staff of the USAC and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to the 49th Annual Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. The USAC and the U.S. Army War College, as always, sponsor the Perspective Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. In addition, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for their support in everything we do here and for already selling out of tonight's books. So, <laughs> so please be aware that other books from our speaker tonight will be on sale behind the lecture hall. Um, all proceeds from the book sales uh, and the gift shop go to our foundation and help expand this uh, facility. Uh, so again, we will have a book signing after the lecture, and we'd love to see you uh, purchase more of those books. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight is my great honor to introduce our speaker, Mr. Peter Cousins. Mr. Cousins has written or edited 17 books about the American West and the American Civil War. His writings include This Terrible Sound, The Battle of Chickamauga, and The Shipwreck of Their Hopes, the Battles for Chattanooga, among many others. His most recent book, The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West, published in 2016, was chosen by Smithsonian Magazine as one of the top 10 history books of 2016 and received the 2017 Gilder Lehrman Prize in Military History. Aside from writing, Mr. Cousins also served as a foreign service officer with the U.S. Department of State and is a recipient of the American Foreign Service Association's highest award. Prior to his work with the Department of the State, Mr. Cousins served as an Army officer for four years. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. Peter Cousins. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Uh, this is the first time that I've been to the new center here. The last time I was at Carlisle Barracks, I uh, was doing research in the old clapboard building many years ago. And I, coming in here this afternoon, I felt like a, a kid in a candy store. I mean, it's just, just a remarkable, remarkable facility. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I'd like to thank Carl uh, for, for all his uh, efforts in, in putting tonight together. And what I want to do, even though I'm going to be talking about my book, I want to start this evening's talk with a scene from the movies. And I'll ask a question that I hope I get uh, some, some positive answers to. Does anybody recognize this scene? Yeah. Little, Big Little Big Man, exactly. And this, this particular scene in Little Big Man um, has come to have an allegorical meaning for me. I like to think of myself when I began my research on The Earth is Weeping as Dustin Hoffman, the rather befuddled uh, army scout we see here, and George Armstrong Custer, who here is preening himself before the Battle of Little Bighorn, and as, as personifying the mythos, the mythology of the Indian Wars. Now, to some degree, myth always distorts history, but I believe that the Indian Wars are uniquely susceptible to this. For 127 years, much of both popular and academic history, film and fiction, has depicted the era as an absolute struggle between good and evil, reversing the roles of uh, heroes and villains as necessary to accommodate a changing national conscience. Now, in the first 80 years after the tragedy at Wounded Knee in 1890, which effectively ended the Indian Wars, the nation romanticized Indian fighters and vilified or trivialized 
the Indians who opposed them. The army appeared as, as the shining knights, so to speak, of an enlightened government dedicated to conquering the wilderness and to, quote, civilizing, unquote, the West and its Native American inhabitants. And of course, no one better conveyed that in cinema than the cinematic duo of John Wayne and director John Ford. Well, in 1970, the story reversed itself, and the pendulum swung to the opposite extreme. Americans were uh, developing an acute sense of the wrongs, the countless wrongs that had been done the Indians. You know, this was the era of the American Indian Movement. The Vietnam War also raised consciousness of, of the, the wrongs done the Indians. And then in 1970, along comes D. Brown's elegantly written and passionately wrought Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, an Indian history of the American West, and later that same year, the film Little Big Man. Both these, but uh, most particularly Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, shaped a new saga that articulated the nation's feelings of guilt. In the public mind, the government and the army became seen as willful exterminators of the native peoples of the West. In The Earth is Weeping, I have tried to bring historical balance to the story of the Indian Wars. And I hesitate to use the word restore, in speaking of balance, because again, it is these pendulum swings that have really defined our understanding of the era. And of course, the first step to presenting a balanced history of anything is to strip away the myths that surround the, the era or the event. Now, there, there are too many myths for us to cover them all this evening. So what I'd like to do then is to address what I consider to be the three most egregious and most commonly held uh, myths. And here they are. First, that the regular army was hell-bent on killing Indians. Secondly, that government Indian policy was exterminationist. And third, that the Indians united to resist the whites. Uh, and before we proceed further, I should, I should uh, maybe make a note. People ask this, you know, why do I refer to Indians and whites? And I, in my book, I use the terminology of the era. And also, um, I've come from many, after many discussions with, with uh, American Indians that generally they prefer the term Indians to Native Americans, ergo the terminology uh, this evening. But before we proceed, Further with, with our, our, our myth busting, let's take a look at the state of the Army, of the US Army, after the Civil War, at the beginning of the Indian Wars that, uh, that I discuss in my book. Well, the regular army that returned to the frontier in 1866 was wholly unprepared for its mission. In, even as the Indian Wars intensified over the course of the next two and a half decades, Congress mercilessly reduced the strength of the regular army from 54,000 officers and men in 1869 to just 25,000 officers and men in 1876. And those soldiers were split between duty in the West and the Reconstruction South. Now, decline, these declining numbers, dramatically declining numbers, were not the only problem that the Army had. We all know, of course, that of the sober and purposeful volunteers who had come out by the hundreds of thousands to restore the Union. Well, they, of course, they were long gone. And in their place after the Civil War was a decidedly inferior brand of soldier. Not not all of them were, quote, bummers and loafers, unquote, as the New York Times alleged. 
There were also a disproportionately large number of urban poor, as well as criminals, drunkards, and perverts. Few soldiers were well-educated, and many were illiterate. Unskilled laborers in search of a steady job flocked to army recruiting depots, and usually they deserted when better paying work presented itself. In fact, anyone want to venture a guess at the average desertion rate in a regiment stationed in the West during Indian Wars? 80%. 80%. Desertion rate. So referring to the, to the quality of the soldiers, um, one uh, general, uh, Christian C. Auger, observed in 1872, he said that you know, while the army had a greatly improved rifle, I rather think we have a much less intelligent soldier to use it. OK, those were the enlisted men in brief. How about the officers? Well, a newly commissioned uh, West Point officer Coming west, found his fellow officers to be a fractious, dispirited, and generally dissipated lot. Here we have uh, two pictures of uh, young officers. The fellow on the on the uh, on my well, the fellow in full uniform here, uh, wearing the dress uniform of the era, um, lieutenant. And uh, I don't know who he is, but, I, but he's in the full dress uniform. Fell on the right, Francis Green. You see how quickly he adapted uh, to, the, to the Western wear, the buckskin wear that a lot of officers wore in the West. But anyway, we have these young lieutenants coming out West, finding their fellow officers uh, a really, really sorry, sorry lot. And, and again, there was really, it's not to be wondered at at all because among other things, promotions in the post-war army were excruciatingly slow. Uh, as Congress cut troop strength, an officer's time and grade, of course, increased commensurately with the shrinking of the army. So a second lieutenant, like one of these guys, who came west, faced 25 years of service before he could hope to reach the rank of major. 25 years to major. And if he lasted that long, 37 years to reach colonel. In 1877, the Army and Navy Journal predicted that within a decade, quote, there will be not, there will not be, excuse me, one fourth part of the present field officers in the Army physically capable of supporting the hardships of active campaign. They will all be worn out old men. Unquote. So in short, even the most dedicated officer found it hard to keep motivated among the rogues gallery of bickering, backbiting, uh, mediocrities, drunks, and martinets and epaulets that plagued the officer corps. Okay, so much for the army in, in a nutshell. Now let's, let's debunk uh, the three myths that I spoke of beginning with the fallacy that the regular army was eager to kill Indians. Does anyone recognize this jaunty gentleman here? That's right, George Crook, who uh, probably ne did not wear a uniform more than a half dozen times during his entire service uh, in the West. Uh, his his um, preferred style of campaign wear, you, you see it, it was a uh, pith helmet, uh, civilian jacket and pants, a mule and a shotgun. Now, Crook was, without a doubt, one of the Army's premier Indian fighting generals. And during the height of the Indian Wars, a newspaper reporter asked Crook how he liked his job. Well, not much, Crook replied. It was a hard thing, the general explained, to be forced to do battle with Indians who more often than not were in the right, said Crook publicly for the record. I do not wonder, and you will not either, that when Indians see their wives and children starving and their last source of supplies cut off, they go to war. And then we are sent out there to kill them. 
It is an outrage. All tribes tell the same story. They are surrounded on all sides. The game is destroyed or driven away. They are left to starve. And there remains but one thing for them to do, fight while they can. Our treatment of the Indian is an outrage. Now, that a, a general officer would offer such a, a candid and forceful public defense of the Indians it may seem implausible today because it contradicts that enduring myth of a regular army that was the implacable foe of the Indians. A crook was far from being the only high-ranking officer to protest the injustice done the Indians. Uh, you all remember John, John Pope of Second Bull Run fame, who uh, after Second being defeated by Robert E. Lee, kind of pushed out west? Well, Pope went on to have quite a career in the west and rose to become a major general in the regular army. In 1874, he was commander of the Department of the Missouri, a huge uh, command that covered most of the, the Great Plains and part of the Rocky Mountains. And Pope, on one occasion, actually suggested that soldiers be sent to help the Indians eliminate white buffalo hunters. Well, buffalo hunters by 1874 had decimated the vast herds of western Kansas, and then they set up shop in an abandoned trading post on the Texas panhandle called Adobe Walls. And in the spring of 1874, they resumed killing buffalo, this time buffalo on Indian reservation land, herds that had been promised the, in, the Indian tribes, the Southern Plains tribes, uh, in per perpetuity as a way of supplementing their government rations. Well, the Army had thought that the fight had gone out of the Southern Plains Indians who had surrendered um, in 1869, but they were wrong. At dawn on June 27, 1874, 500 warriors spilled down a steep ridge a half mile east of Adobe Walls and made a dash to wipe out the despised buffalo hunters. The doors of the sod shacks slammed shut and the 29 white men battled the attackers to a standstill. One buffalo hunter managed to slip through the Indian lines at night and rode all the way to Kansas for help. The governor of Kansas, in turn, appealed to General Pope at Fort Leavenworth to dispatch troops to raise the siege. Well, Pope turned the governor down flat. So he said, Indians, like white men, are not reconciled to starve peacefully. The buffalo hunters have justly earned all that may befall them. If I were to send troops to the locality of this unlawful establishment, it would be to break it up and not protect it, unquote. Well, fortunately or unfortunately for the buffalo hunters, depending on your point of view, the Indians uh, broke the siege after two days and, and uh, troops, troops weren't needed. But uh, that, that stunt on Pope's part actually almost cost him his command. General Phil Sheridan, his superior officer, did not, did not share Pope's views about uh, using the army to help the Indians kill whites. And again, there are several other episodes that if, if we had time I could, I could discuss that, that illustrate this, the point that the plight of the Indians deeply disturbed most senior officers, and they more often than not sympathize with the hostile Indians that they were charged with subduing. Okay, so much for the Army Officer Corps. What may be said of government Indian policy, of the Indian policy that they were charged with enforcing? Now, we can, we can question the wisdom or the morality of government policy, but it cannot be said that the govern, government ever intended to physically exterminate the Indians. And I can't stress that strongly enough. That the Indian way of life 
must be eradicated if the Indians were to survive was, however, taken for granted. What we would call today, I suppose, cultural, cultural genocide. But physical genocide, never contemplated. After the Civil War, um, federal Indian policy evolved in, in fits and starts. And uh, I guess we, I should mention this, this slide for those of you who ha have read my book or, or maybe are about to, I hope. Um, this photograph represents uh, an episode in the prologue of the book. Uh, these are chiefs of a Cheyenne or Apaho delegation to Washington, D.C. in 1863. This is Chief Lean Bear. And the woman right here is Mary Todd Lincoln. Well, speaking of Lincoln, you know, of course, when the Civil War ended, Lincoln was dead, and uh, federal Indian policy was in tatters. Neither President Andrew Johnson nor Congress were able to, to fashion anything resembling a coherent Indian policy, which left things in the in the mid-1860s, uh, as General William T. Sherman put it, left things to the caprice and the hazard. Beside the lack of a coherent Indian policy in the first years after the Civil War, another problem that, um, that exacerbated the situation was rampant corruption in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs absolutely stank of corruption. This is a, uh, a famous uh, Thomas Nast illustration from Harper's Weekly showing a government Indian agent, Indian agent obviously well-fed and the starving Indian beside him. There was a popular story told during that time of a, of a chief who described his Indian agent to General Sherman, who was the uh, ranking officer in the West, the commanding officer in the West. He described his agent to General Sherman in these terms. He said, our agent, great man. When he comes, he brings everything in a little bag. When he goes, it takes four steamboats to carry away his things. Perhaps Nass had that in mind when he drew this cartoon. In 1869, there was a new president, Ulysses S. Grant. And he declared famously, and much to the surprise of many, with respect to the Indians, let us have peace. He initiated a carrot and stick body of principles that came to be called the peace policy. Grant replaced uh, the corrupt agents with religious men, especially Quakers, and with army officers. He established independent oversight of the Indian Bureau, and he appointed as Commissioner of Indian Affairs a full-blooded Seneca Indian. You may recognize him. This is Grant's former military secretary, Eli S. Parker. Uh, Parker subscribed to the prevailing view that the Indians' future lay in acculturation. Parker directed Indian agents to assemble the Indians in their jurisdictions on permanent reservations that were well removed from the overland travel routes and from uh, white settlements, which of course became more and more difficult as the years went on and the white population of the West grew. But they were to, again, remove them onto reservations and then get them, on, get them started on the road to, quote, civilization, unquote, and above all, to treat them with kindness and patience. Now, Indians who refused to settle on reservations would be turned over to the military uh, and treated as, quote, friendly or hostile as circumstances might justify, unquote. Although uh, kindness and patience, not to mention common decency were often lacking in the implementation of uh, Indian policy and some reforms such as the replacing of corrupt patronage agents were abandoned. The principles that Grant and Parker promulgated officially guided federal policy throughout most of the Indian Wars era. That is to say, gather Indians on reservations and begin the process of civilizing, Christianizing them, trying to turn them into to 
to, to essentially white men. But the end result of, of the policy, of course, as we all know, was to dispossess the Indians of their lands. And from this, a question naturally arises, how did the Indians respond to the broken promises and to the relentless white encroachment on their lands? And that brings us to the third enduring myth that I want to dispel this evening. The myth that the Indians united to resist the whites. Anyone familiar with this kind of artwork here? This is, uh, this is called ledger book art. And it was very common among the, the Plains Indians and the post-Civil War years. What they would do is, uh, and you can, if you look close, you can see the, the writing on this ledger book, like it you know, like belonged to a storekeeper or something. What they would do is either steal or buy or, or, or somehow acquire these ledger books, and they would uh, paint quite colorfully what they considered to be the defining deeds of their lives as warriors, I mean, the, the most important martial deeds. And invariably, I'd say 80% of the illustrations in ledger books were of Indians killing other Indians. Here we see a Cheyenne Indian on horseback uh, running a Pawnee Indian through with a saber. So as this, as this picture kind of uh, graphically demonstrates, the Indians not only failed to unite in opposing the westward expansion of civilization, but they also continued to make war on one another, even as this process was taking place. And that was because intertribal warfare was too deeply ingrained in their cultures for them to act otherwise. The tribes in the West, with very, very, very few exceptions, were warrior cultures. And a, a man's entire self-worth, his place in society, was defined by the martial deeds that he had performed. And um, generally, that was against other, other Indians. Um, wars were fought, again, for martial honors, for land, uh, to steal horses, to steal women. But intertribal warfare, by the time whites began coming onto the onto the plains and into the Rocky Mountains in the Northwest, Southwest, was so in deeply ingrained in their culture that it was, aside from a f you know, few alliances, it was, it was, there was no sense of, of Indianness, so to speak, uh, until it was far, far too late. But during the course of the Indian Wars, a, an army officer asked a Cheyenne chief, friend of his, why his tribe preyed on their Crow Indian neighbors. And the chief said, we stole the hunting grounds of the Crows because they were the best. We wanted more land. And here we see a Crow, run, I mean, a, a Cheyenne running through an unfortunate Crow. Or uh, as a Lakota, that is to say a Sioux, a Lakota chief told a government Treaty negotiator, he said, you have split my land and I do not like it. These lands once belonged to the Kiowas and the Crows, but we whipped these nations out of them. And in this, we did what the white men do when they want the lands of the Indians. Uh, I don't know if the chief saw the uh, irony in his, in his statement, but this was certainly a sentiment that acquisitive whites determined to clear the West of Indians could readily appreciate. Now, one of the things that's frequently lost in the mythos of the Indian Wars are the numerous tribes that accepted the white presence. Now, these tribe, tribes like the Shoshone, the Pawnee, the Crow, these tribes are dismissed, for instance, in Bury My Heart and Wounded Knee as mercenaries, mere mercenaries which was hardly the case. These tribes united with the whites, basically following the old axiom that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And these were tribes that were surrounded 
uh, by other tribes that were superior in numbers and strength, and they united with the whites. Uh, a good example of this are the Pawnee Indians, who were vitally important to the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, if you folks see uh, Helen Wheels, the series about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, well, you see a lot in, in that series, you see a lot of, um, of the uh, Lakota and the Cheyenne raids on the railroad, but somehow you don't see, it, you don't see the Pawnee, uh, which, which is kind of odd. But anyway, to the historical story, in the summer of 1867, Lakota and Cheyenne raids brought work on the railroad to a standstill. They, they were attacking uh, the road crews, track, attacking surveying, uh, surveying parties, and, and the work on the railroad just came to complete standstill. The army proved uh, inept, absolutely incapable of tracking down these fast-moving war parties. So what was done? A battalion of Pawnee warriors were recruited and armed and uniformed as soldiers. Here we see some uh, members of the Pawnee battalion uh, receiving orders from uh, army officers. Well, the Pawnee mangled one large Cheyenne war party so badly that raids on the railroad line re stopped and work resumed on the Transcontinental Railroad unimpeded. And I think it's fair to say that the presence of the Pawnee Battalion shaved at least a year off the construction of the Union Pacific and maybe two seasons off Hell on Wheels. Well, as destructive as the fighting between tribes was, what ultimately doomed Indian resistance was the inability of individual tribes to maintain cohesion against the white threat. The only tribes that maintained cohesion, that, that stayed together as a tribe, were those that accepted the white presence. No tribe that was famous for fighting the government, not the Apache, not the Lakota, not the Cheyenne, not the Comanche, not the Kiowa, none of these tribes were ever unified for war or for peace. Each tribe had what might call its war or traditionalist faction and its peace or accommodationist faction that struggled for dominance and clashed sometimes violently with one another. The, the Kiowa of the Southern Plains offer, I think, a particularly tragic example of a tribe torn asunder. This young chief here, this is, his name is Kicking Bird. He was the, uh, the acknowledged chief of the Kiowa accommodationist or peace faction. He almost single-handedly kept most of the Kiowas out of the Red River War, which was the final great struggle for the Southern Plains and which followed the attack on Adobe Walls. Nevertheless, despite, you know, despite his, his success in keeping the Kiowas out of the conflict, the government coerced him into selecting a quota of supposed Kiowa instigators of the Red River War for imprisonment in Florida. The army, the government had this idea of, let's take the, let's look for the, try to find the instigators of this conflict uh, from among the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Kiowa, and let's send them to, to Florida for a year, maybe two years for imprisonment, and that will, uh, that will uh, tame them, so to speak. Well, so poor Kicking Bird, it falls to him to select the, uh, the Kiowa quota. Um, if you ask me, the real instigators were the Buffalo Hunters. They should have been sent to Florida to prison. But be that as it may, this task fell to Kicking Bird. To ease the burden on his tribe, he chose mostly Mexican captives and tribal delinquents. Which was a good ta tactic as far as it went, but he also selected a vicious war leader named Mamantai. Uh, Mamantai was Kicking Bird's, one of Kicking Bird's rivals, and he was a vicious, vic a vicious war leader behind almost all Kiowa raids during the 1870s. Well, Kicking Bird's reluctant complicity 
cost him his life as he was seeing the prisoners off with words of affection and a promise that their imprisonment would be brief, mamantai hextum. You think you have done well. You think you are free, a big man with the whites, but you will not live long. I will see to that." Unquote. The next day, Kicking Bird died after drinking a cup of coffee. The army surgeon who treated him said he had been poisoned with strychnine. There had been a, a fatalistic element in Kicking Bird's struggle to maintain peace in the unending hatred between Indians and whites, Kicking Bird foresaw the apocalypse. I fear blood must flow and my heart is sad, he told a Quaker friend before the Red River War. The white man is strong, but he cannot destroy us all in one year. It will take him two or three, maybe four years. And then the world will turn to water or burn up. It is our mother and cannot live when the Indians are all dead. But with Kicking Bird's words, tragic words, I will conclude my remarks. We'll re take a quick review of the three myths that I, I hope I've maybe at least partially convinced you are in fact myths that the regular army was hell-bent on killing Indians, that government Indian policy was exterminationist, and that the Indians united to uh, resist the whites. So I hope I've left you a little bit less confused than our friend Dustin Hoffman was here at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And for those who, who like to read multiple languages, here are various editions of my book. <laughs> And with that, I will uh, open the floor to, uh, to questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, oh yes, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Myself and uh, my intern Claudia over on the other side will be coming around with the microphones. Again, please make sure you raise your hand. We'll come to you with the microphone and please speak directly into it. Uh, but is there anybody who'd like to get the questions started? Right back here in the corner. How many Indians were there in the West at the beginning of this, or during this period? Well, that's a wonderful question. I should have had it in the body of my talk. Thank you for asking it. Uh, no one knows for certain, but um, if you base uh, estimates off of um, Indian agency roles and then try to, um, from there, kind of guesstimate the number of Indians who were off the agencies, there were, on the, in the West overall, entire West, from, say, the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean, uh, approximately 200,000, maybe 250,000 Indians. On the Plains, there were about 75,000 Indians, um, of whom, of that number, Perhaps 15,000 were warriors or men of warrior age, uh, you know, spread out among the various tribes. The largest tribe in the West was the Lakota, again, commonly known as the Sioux. The Lakota numbered between 16 and 18,000 people. And um, some of the tribes were quite small. By the, to by the time of the, the, we're speaking of, the Kiowa had been reduced by disease and, and warfare to maybe 1,500 members. Do we have any other questions? I okay. hope so, we have. Oh, here we go, right, right down there in front. Yes, sir. I'm just a bit confused on the myths. Um, when you take a race of people and you say we're gonna destroy their culture and make them into something that they're not, isn't that kind of the same thing as destroying the people? Secondly, when you say that, and the second myth about the, the army not being hell-bent to kill the Indian, boy, they sure as hell went out of their way to do it. And, and I don't, maybe, maybe it was a policy somebody wrote down a piece of paper, but I just wonder if the guys on the plains understood that. When they 
cheated them and, and, and killed them and just... I, frankly, I don't know what you're talking about with respect to the, your, your latter part of your question. The army did not go out of... The regular army did not, with one exception, one massacre, the, the massacre in the Marias River, in Marias River in Montana, perpetrated by a drunk major. The army did not go out of its way to kill Indians. That when the Indians surrendered, they were taken prisoners. And lied to and cheated to and, and everything stolen from them. I mean, it's, it, you kill them more than with a bullet. Well, I, I beg to differ that you, you are exaggerating the point. And the army did not, was not, were not the ones that went out of the way to lie and cheat. For instance, ne Nelson Miles, maybe you're familiar with. I'm familiar, I'm familiar with some of the generals you spoke of in your book. I think they, 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 they speak well of them. No question about it. But do they speak for the entire army? They spoke for the vast majority of the officer corps. I'll give you an example. Uh, Nelson Miles, when the Nez Perce surrendered to him, uh, the Nez Perce were trying to escape to Canada. They surrendered on the condition which he promised them that they would be allowed to return to the Nez Perce reservation, which they had not wanted to live on. This was one, one segment of the tribe that tried to escape to Canada. And he wrote a letter right after the surrender saying, you know, with anything like fair treatment by the government, we could turn the Nez Pearson to our good friends within, within a year. And when he found out that they were not to be returned home, he spent the rest of his career fighting uh, to, to try to get, get the Nez Perce voice heard. And he was one of the ones instrumental in bringing Chief Joseph to Washington. So, sir, I beg to entirely differ with you in the former, uh, latter point. As to your former point, um, Physical genocide, physical extermination, again, I said physical extermination was never contemplated by the government. Yes, cultural extermination, yes, even by the most enlightened Indian uh, advocates of Indian rights of the day. If you read the books of, of people like Helen Hunt Jackson, who wrote a book called A Century of Dishonor, uh, just, just um, a, a, a scathing indictment of U.S. policy. Her preface, what is the best way to Christianize the Indian, to make a farmer of him, to make a, a good citizen of him? Even the, most, even the most ardent advocates of Indian rights saw nothing in Indian culture worth preserving. So you have to make that distinction. If, if the, and that's the distinction I, I, I wanted to make, because for too long there's been this conception that the government wanted to physically exterminate them. Well, if, Indian, if the government had wanted to physically exterminate hostile Indians, guess what? They would have. There was nothing to stop them. There was, it was not like you know, Nazi Germany being defeated by foreign armies. There was nothing to stop them. So that, I'm sorry, there's okay. no historical basis. Okay, I mean, maybe no historical basis, but I've heard statements, and, and, it, and I think somewhat even in your book, where the statement was made, the Indians will be put on the reservation, those not on the reservations will be considered hostile, therefore subject to, to extermination. Now that's, I, I think I read that, I think I read that in your book. And I read that in other books too. Go to the reservation or you're gonna die. There Thank were you. There were instances, a few instances where, where Sherman and Sheridan, Sherman, um, after the Fetterman massacre, uh, defeat of, uh, of a, 80-man army command was so incensed that he, he said, we must hunt the, the Sudan to the last man, woman, and child and exterminate them. That was Sherman. That's the way Sherman talked. He, he, he oftentimes spoke before he thought. Um, did that happen? No. He was part of the, the, the uh, government peace negotiating party that brought an end to Red Clouds, brought an end to the war. Uh, so, yes, there were things that were said in the heat of the moment but they were not put into execution. Were women and children inadvertently killed? I'm not standing here trying to defend the army. I'm trying to tell you what I have found based on five years of researching both Indian and white records and what, what the record tells us. Uh, were women and children killed? Yes. Was it intentional? The exception of Sand Creek, which was perpetrated by volunteers during the Civil War, not the regular army, uh, by a bunch of Colorado gutter trash in blue uniforms, and this massacre in the Marias River. No, it was not intentional. Even, even Custer, at the Battle of the Washita, when he heard that uh, women were being fired on, ordered a, ordered a stop to it. Occasionally, women would pick up 
rifles and fight with the men. They became combatants, and, uh, uh, but it was not, not willful on the part of the army. And of course, there are always a few exceptions. You're always going to find a soldier who's going to commit, in any war who's going to commit atrocities. It's the nature of warfare. But it was not, not officially sanctioned. All right, we have one right here in front. Uh, thank you for being so very bold in the venture onto thin ice on the subject of the American Indians. Uh, it is my understanding that as president, Ulysses Grant proposed citizenship for the American Indians sometime in the early 1870s, but that uh, I would like you, I'm sure you must know about that and, and how far it went, but it was not until I think the 1930s that they were actually given citizenship in this country. Yeah, I, can't, I, mean, I can't really speak to anything beyond the period of the Indian Wars, to be, to be honest. But Grant was not alone in suggesting that. George Crook suggested that. Benjamin Grierson suggested that. Uh, a number of people did. Um, but it didn't, it didn't really go anywhere, uh, unfortunately. Um, I will say one thing, um, somewhat to your, to your point, that there is an epi a very episode... Um, that I discuss in the book, President Grant unfortunately uh, yielded to um, the lesser instincts, and that was in 1875. He was trying; the government was trying to get the Black Hills from the Indians. The Black Hills uh, had been discovered to be rich in gold, and the, the uh, reservation chiefs did not want to sell it. So Grant uh, brought together a handful of like-minded officers, Sheridan. Crook and uh, his Secretary of War and Secretary of Interior and tried to form, figure out how they could um, uh, precipitate a war with the, with the Lakota to essentially cheat them out of their land. That, that is the lowest moment, uh, in, uh, I think, in, for Crook and Sheridan and Grant. Um, so um, I guess I should say nothing is black and white. In fairness, in fairness to you, in fairness, to, fairness to history, absolutely. And um, I, um, for those who want to pursue that, pretty sorry episode in greater detail. I wrote an article about it for Smithsonian Magazine uh, last year. That's uh, that's well worth reading. So um, I was getting a, a bit a bit too riled in my in my comments to to acknowledge there, there's there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray. You're, you're right, but. Um, but again, we need to make the ex this distinction between you know, the physical extermination and cultural extermination. Um, a lot of gray areas in the story. Yeah, yes, sir. Right over there in the third row. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Washita, and then you, meant, you also spoke about in 75 and 76 the campaign. Uh, to bring the Indians back to the reservation through sort of any means and declare them hostile when, in fact, uh, most of the information I've seen, there, it wasn't possible for them to get back to the reservation on time. They couldn't possibly make it. They were nomadic. They were looking for, to feed their, their, their large herds. Everything was turning green. They left. They were never coming back. So they knew they were going to have a fight on their hands. And at the Washita, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, they, they did. They, they killed women, children, anything they could kill. But the bad part, and here's my question, here, here's a question coming. Why were so many things whitewashed and covered up? Because a great many of the after action reports where, where the massacres or the killing was reported, then there was a great, there, there was an effort to protect, it appeared to be to protect the officers. Would you comment on that? Which uh, campaigns in particular are you referring to? Well, the number of Indians killed at the Washington actually was not very high. Of course, it was a small village. Uh, Custer vastly inflated the number of warriors he killed and uh, um, probably understated by, by a fair number the number of women and children who died. And um, uh, I think he did that um, in part to, uh, to make himself look good. We wipe, we wipe, I mean, as I, as I mentioned in my book, he, he declared that he, 7th Cavalry had killed more warriors 
than there could possibly have been in a village of that size. So I think he's just trying to, you know, boost his reputation uh, and that of the Seventh Cavalry. Um, there, um, again, the other bit, the one real true massacre on the Marias River in Montana when, uh, I forget the precise number, but a couple hundred, at least a couple hundred um, peaceable uh, Blackfeet Indians were, were massacred, literally massacred uh, by a drunken, drunken major. Um, the uh, government sent out an, uh, an army officer to investigate who, and he spoke to the, spoke to Indian survivors, and the truth did come out. Um, but um, there was, yeah, there was some whitewashing, and uh, just as there are, I guess, in after action reports and in most wars. Um, but there was some of that, yeah. And um, um, both Sherman and Sheridan, while they um, did not condone this, they also feared a backlash, too, if, if word, knowledge of this became too great. Because the Army, I mean, they were protecting the institution. The Army was constant, Congress was constantly looking for excuses to cut the Army back even further. So there was kind of a knee-jerk reaction, I think, to defend the institution from without, because it was really, the army was really a beleaguered institution during that time. Again, that's not a moral, um, uh, uh, you know, moral observation, it's just kind of, the, I think, the way they reacted. All right, we have one right over here. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I truly uh, look forward to uh, reading the book, The uh, Earth is Weeping. Uh, question for you. Um, I know that during this era, I think in 1866, there were several um, black regiments stood up, specifically the 9th and 10th Cavalry. I know as you opened, you spoke some about the, uh, the caliber and the characteristics of the soldier during this era. I've, I've heard differently of the, the, the Buffalo Soldiers as the Indians eventually, I, I'm told that's who named them, Buffalo Soldiers, those regiments. Uh, so during your research, is there anything that you found that, that maybe you know, really speaks to that era and the relationship and how uh, those uh, organizations performed and established relationships with the... Uh, Thank you for asking that question. In fact, I wish I had time to read from my book uh, the pages that I devote to the Buffalo Soldiers. There, there were four regiments, two of infantry and uh, two of cavalry, the 9th and 10th. Uh, I was in the 9th Cavalry myself in the Army, so... Um, they um, were called the Buffalo Soldiers. No one's quite sure exactly, you know, who named them Buffalo Soldiers. But as I point out in, in, my, in a chapter where I talk about the quality of the Army, I said that you know, there was one, one group of soldiers who seldom drank to excess, who seldom deserted, and who, who fought hard and well. And those were the black soldiers of the, of the, Buffalo, of the 9th and 10th Cal Cavalry. They, they were the exception. They the 9th and 10th Cavalry. The two infantry regiments really did not see any active service against the Indians. 9th and 10th Cavalry, they were uh, exemplary units. They were led by white officers uh, who, um, and the, the black enlisted men, for the most part, were former slaves. Uh, the majority were illiterate. Um, but they, and this comes across from the writings that I've read of literate black soldiers and also their white officers who, who invariably came to have a high regard for them observed that, you know, that the, the, the black en, en, uh, enlisted men, they really perceived their service as a way of, of I put it, of, of furthering the cause of their race. You know, that, that, their, that on their honorable service would speak well of their, of their people. And, uh, and they were except, exceptionally good soldiers. They were, they, they, uh, they, were the, they were the exception to the rule in, in the West, no, no question about it. And unfortunately, the, uh, you know, the racism was, was, of course, was, was what it was. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, they often got the worst duty posts, like out on the Texas panhandle and the, some of the and poor supplies. Um, but there's, uh, there's one, one incident that's kind of funny that uh, there was, 
an episode called the Ute War, where the Ute Indians had besieged um, a white cavalry unit. And uh, a white cavalry unit was really just hanging on by a thread. And a troop of uh, buffalo soldiers rode past the, the besieging Ute Indians, who for some reason didn't fire on the, the buffalo soldiers, and into the, into the lines that really helped save the white soldiers and shared their rations with them. And this one captain of the one uh, army, one captain of a white, the white unit said, boy, you sure are the whitest looking Negroes I've ever seen. And that was, I guess, a backhanded, backhanded way of complimenting the Buffalo soldiers. Um, but they were fine troops. Sure. How did the Indians fit into the concept of manifest destiny? Wow. Um, well, that's, that's a PhD dissertation right there. Uh, they, they really didn't as Indians. I mean, they, from what I've read of the concept of manifest destiny as, as it was articulated in the 1840s, uh, the West was for the, for the white man. And by white man, I mean whites, you know, Americans, immigrants, free blacks. And the Indians were just not part of the picture. And so the policy that developed was to segregate them on reservations. And you know, it was hoped that they would become like white men and, uh, and not, not, uh, not, have, not you know, go the way of the passenger pigeon. Uh, but they, they were not, they were an obstacle, I guess, to be overcome, like any, like a phys any physical obstacles in the West. I, guess, I think that's the short, an the short answer. All right. Uh, we got one, let's see, uh, right up here in front. I'm not sure if this is really pertaining to wars, but can you tell us anything about the children that were brought here to Carlisle. Were they brought here? Were they taken from their families? Uh, punished if they spoke their language? What can you tell us? Um, they were, in many instances, taken from their families. Uh, yes, they were out of here. I, when I read, they were punished if they spoke their language. Um, you know, they got here, their hair was shorn, they were, and they were put in white man's clothing. But there also were uh, chiefs of tribes like the Crow, like the Shoshone, who, and many Lakota also, who sent their children voluntarily to Carlisle, especially uh, as we get closer to the end of the Indian War Zero, like the late 1880s. Um, and they saw the handwriting on the wall, and they, they, they realized that the only future for their children was that they're assimilating and becoming becoming uh, anglicized. Unfortunately, when these children came back to the reservations, there was little for them to do. Um, and um, they were often seen as outcasts by those who would remain behind, those of their generation. And there's a, one re particularly tragic example occurred during the Wounded Knee Campaign uh, after the Battle of, after the Wounded Knee tragedy. Um, there was a, a army lieutenant whose name escapes me, um, who was very, very much, uh, very well liked by the Lakota. He was very, uh, very, uh, very interested in Lakota and their culture. Just a, a good, a good guy. And this young Lakota warrior shot him in cold blood. Chief Red Cloud actually sent a message to warn this lieutenant that this guy was out to get him, and this young Indian killed him. Uh, and again, his, his name escapes me at the moment, um, partly because I'm so deeply into researching my next book. I'm losing some of the names here, but he, um, this young Indian warrior who killed the lieutenant in cold blood, just in, no provocation, he was tried and actually acquitted of murder uh, by a civilian jury, and he was asked why he'd done it. He said, well, you know, he'd come back from Carlisle. He spoke perfect English. He said, I came back to the reservation. I was an outcast 
among my people. I had to prove myself as a warrior. So he shot this lieutenant. That's an extreme case, but that's, that illustrates part of the problem. Thank you, funny horse. Thank you very much. Hey, sir, how are you? Mike Moon. Uh, I've spent a couple years out west, and this will probably be out of left field for you, right field. But as you look at the work you've done, I'm a couple chapters into your book, it's phenomenal. But you look at the mythology, and good history should not only provide the nuance and the context, but potentially inform current and future policy. Specifically, if you look at the way we're treating Indians now, Native Americans, if you look at the Bears Ears National Monument, and there's a great deal of effort into potentially scaling back what Obama did on December 28th, if you look at the Utah delegation, if you look at the five tribes that came together to unite and work with the government, are there any parallels or associated mythologies that are impacting the way we think today? And again, if it's out of left field or your right field, I appreciate it. Well, that. You know, I did a lot of thinking of, uh, about that during the Standing Rock uh, confrontations over the oil pipeline. You know, uh, and I found that just reprehensible. Um, in fact, uh, one of the Indian Indians who was, uh, you know, a, a part of the intertribal council who was resisting this contacted me and asked me if, if I thought they had any, you know, just, I mean, obviously they had, they had attorneys, but what I thought, if I thought they had legal standing, and unfortunately, the area in question was not part of the Great Sioux Reservation, but it was ironic that you know the the risk of the water supply. You know the whole idea was that the, pipe, the pipeline originally was going to pass close to the drinking water supply of Bismarck, South Dakota, and we they didn't want to run the risk of contaminating the water at Bismarck, so they moved the pipeline closer to the, on into Indian land. So if it broke, it would contaminate the Indians' water supply. Um, I found that whole thing, I find all this despicable, but um, to me it seems to stem from uh, uh, ignorance on a part of a lot of people of what, what the living conditions are among many of the tribes in the West. Um, this, I can't say that it comes from any of the myths we've talked about, because among mo most people, still subscribe to these myths to the extent that they understand the Indian wars at all. So I don't think it's that. I think it's just uh, their voice isn't, uh, isn't heard loudly enough and they're not a large enough political force to be reckoned with. I don't know, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, yes, I understand that there were some Indian tribes that fought for the South in the Civil War. My question is, um, who were they? And if there was any kind of um, consequences to those tribes for f fighting for the South? Right, that, that uh, unfortunately, the five so-called civilized tribes, which you, alluded, which you alluded to, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, um, Seminole, and I'm forgetting one, Creek, um, you know, and, uh, President Jackson sent them out west to present-day eastern Oklahoma for resettlement. And the Cherokee in particular were, sp were split between, I mean, in their sympathies between north and south. So there were Cherokee units and to a lesser extent, Choctaw and Creek and, and others who fought for the south. And the, the tribes as a whole were punished with the loss of some of their land as a consequence of portions of their tribe fighting for the South. I don't really get into that in my book too much, affect much at all, because I'm, this occurred during the Civil War, and you know, that's part of my introductory chapter, but I, I focus on the, you know, the, the conflicts after the Civil War. But, but it was, it was, those were the tribes. The, uh, the tribes that we're talking about here, um, the, you know, the, the tribes of the Plains and the Rockies and the Southwest and the Northwest, uh, they, they understood a war was going on, um, but they didn't actively take part on either side. Uh, there was, it was often thought by, by northern officers that some of the Plains tribes were 
uh, going to form some kind of alliance with Confederate agents and this and that, but nothing ever, there was nothing to that, nothing ever materialized. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question. I got one back in the back right here. Hi, thank you for um, breaking a lot of the myths, because I grew up in a era of listening to a lot of those, so I appreciate your efforts. My question to you is probably a present-day question, and I assume that you uh, discussed, uh, part of your research was probably talking to present-day tribes, finding out what their history has in their stories and so forth. Have you uh, presented your book and this presentation to different tribes and what has been, has there been any pushback on any of your findings or any of your myths? I, have, I haven't uh, made any formal presentations, but I've corresponded with, you know, a number of Indians who've read the book and, and talked to folks at the, uh, who I know at the uh, Museum of the American Indian. And, and the, the reaction has generally been very positive, po and particularly uh, positive in, in so far as I tell the story from both perspectives. I mean, if, when you, if you read the book, you'll see, I hope you'll see that there, I have just about as many eyewitness accounts by Indians as I do by soldiers or, or, or other whites. So, and I, so again, I try to present a balanced perspective. And Indian oral history is not as reliable as you might think. I discovered that with the Chiricahua Apaches. Um, um, it's absolutely unreliable because you know, the Chiricahua, for instance, they're still, they're still divided uh, into the Geronimo faction and the, the Nietzsche faction. I mean, they're, they're still divided into factions that existed during the Indian Wars. And so they embellish or diminish stories to serve their ends as well. Um, and uh, I mean, the Lakota are guilty of it as a, as a people, you know, calling the Black Hills sacred land, you know, the, the, land, that, that the grounds where the ancestors were buried, that's, that's a bunch of nonsense. And then, I mean, that nonsense. They, they had only seized the, the Black Hills um, a couple of generations earlier from the, uh, the Kiowa and the Crow. And when you read the, the, the actual Indian words during the negotiations for the sale of the Black Hills, they never once talk about any religious uh, significance beyond a vague sense that that there, was, there were some strong spiritual forces in the Black Hills. What they, what they considered the Black Hills to be was their, as Sitting Bull put it, he called it their meat, their meat locker, basically translated. It was, it was their source of, of, of wealth in times of, of hardship. Uh, and um, one of the, uh, the Lakota chiefs, uh, one of the two principal Lakota reservation chiefs, he, uh, he asked for $21 million for, Lakota, for the Black Hills. He wanted enough. He wanted enough to uh, sustain his people, so that the interest on that amount would sustain his people for seven generations. So they saw, they saw it in economic terms. Today, it's become, you know, it's had it's developed this mystic aura uh, for the Lakota. So you've got to be careful of that. And, and uh, I'm discovering that now. I'm, my my next book will be a biography of Chief Tecumseh of the Shawnee and uh, his. Pan Indian Confederacy, and the kind of the last of the war for the old Northwest. Uh, and I'm finding this, the same thing with with, uh, with Shawnee tribal uh, history. It's 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 just uh, it's just not that reliable. I, but I, where I got my information was from written so sources for Indians who were interviewed at the time, and uh, you know there or shortly after the Indian Wars. And there, there are words taken down by ethnologists, uh, amateur or otherwise, from, um, in, in some cases, after some Indian conflicts, Congress actually invited the hostile chiefs to Washington, D.C. to present their case before Congress. So I have that testimony. I have, te I have Indian uh, words from treaty negotiations. Of course, all this suffered some degree from in the quality of interpretation, but there was, there's no shortage of, of good written Indian sources of, of the time, and those are what I 
I, I find you know, pretty reliable. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we can have a big hand for uh, Mr. Cousins. Now, uh, we have, uh, for the, unfortunately, very last time, it's my great pleasure and honor to, uh, to ask uh, Colonel Peter Crane to come on up and make a quick presentation. Thanks, Carl, and thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Oh, sir, please don't sit down. This is about oh. you. <laughs> he must have gotten the word that I tend to get long-winded. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for coming tonight. This is really uh, wonderful to see, and what a great presentation. We had a conversation earlier at dinner about uh, the fact that this uh, period of American history tends to be overlooked uh, quite a bit. And uh, I think you see tonight why there are, there are some great historians that are uh, covering an area and, and bringing light to a topic that just doesn't get the... the uh, the attention that it deserves. So um, I hope you'll accept this as oh, our cool. small token of appreciation. That's the advertisement that we used uh, for your uh, presentation night, and obviously you can see it worked. Um, so uh, we hope that finds a, a special place for you. Thank you, I love it. And my wife found this to be a very good likeness of me. <laughs> That's great.